Belshazzar used the gold goblets of God's temple for drinking wine. He used the gold goblets of God's temple for drinking wine. Let's read verses 1 through 4. King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem to be brought that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. Then they uh, brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. The year is about 539 BC. Location, the city of Babylon. Almost 70 years had passed ever since uh, all these exiles from Judah came into Babylon. Daniel had come into Babylon about 70 years ago as a young fellow. Daniel now is about 80 years. And some scholars say precisely he could have been about 84 years old as well. It had been 24 years since Nebuchadnezzar the Great, about whom we'd been studying in the last four chapters, had died. His son's name is Nebuchadnezzar, whose son in turn is Belshazzar. And of course, you will see the word father, father coming for uh, Belshazzar when referring to Nebuchadnezzar because the Hebrew did not have a word for father. If you want to refer to your grandfather, you usually write father's father, but there's no Hebrew word for grandfather. And that's why most of the children of Israel used to say, Abraham is our father. So there's no word for Hebrew in the word There's no word for father in the Hebrew language, and that's why it is written that way. But actually, Nebuchadnezzar the Great was Belshazzar's grandfather. So his grandson, Belshazzar, sits on the throne of a shrinking empire centered in this great city of Babylon. Outside the massive walls of the city of Babylon, there there was a kingdom, there was an empire, and a huge army that was waiting to make inroads into the city. And that was the Medo Persian Empire. But the walls were huge. They would protect the city at any cost is what these people thought. And from being the mightiest empire in the world once upon a time, under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, it had shrunk only to this particular city, the city of Babylon. But inside, like I said, the city residents felt very secure. Why did they feel secure? Because they were protected by a double line of walls that stretched at 15 kilometers circumference around the city. At some parts, the walls were about 85 feet high. At other parts, some scholars say that the walls were about 350 feet high, and so nobody could scale them. And not just that, this, the river Euphrates went diagonally across the city, and uh, there were 100 watchtowers around it trying to protect people from invaders. And to top it all up, there was a stockpile of 20 years of food inside the city. And so the city and the residents could actually outlast any siege. That was the kind of city that Babylon was. Great, mighty, well protected. And all over the city people were excited here because the king was throwing a great party. And the Bible says he called some thousand noblemen, their wives and all of them. And if you look at the waiters and and everybody, the onlookers and all of that, scholars say that the number could be about 8,000 people who were at the party or at least watching it. But I think the king's party was a way of diverting attention from the events outside the walls. It was a massive morale booster for them. It was meant to lift the spirits of the entire city. And in the ancient times, any party had three important things. Number one was food, number two was wine, number three was women. Food, wine, and women. And that was all present in this party. Course after course, food was served. Wine was just flowing. And of course, women were there for the taking as well. And evidently, the party got off to a great start. Lots of laughter, lots of bright conversations around the tables. And all of a sudden, King Belshazzar stops the party, so to speak, And he calls one of his attendants and he says, Why don't you go and get those goblets of gold that my father Nebuchadnezzar had brought from the temple in Jerusalem? And after these gold goblets and silver goblets are brought, 
wine is poured into them. There is the ooze and the ass coming from the crowd because you're dr- drinking from the sacred uh, cups of the temple. It is, a, it is a massive thing to do. And then there was a huge uproar and there was celebration going on. And all of a sudden, somebody began to sing a song. A song to the gods of Babylon. And somebody else picked it up as well. And they were all worshipping in unison the gods of gold, gods of silver, gods of wood, and all of that. So King Nebuchadnezzar used the gold goblets of God's temple for drinking wine. Then there's a second thing that we'd like to look at in this episode. The Lord intervened immediately by writing his verdict on the wall. The Lord intervened immediately by writing his verdict on the wall. Verses 5 and 6. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, opposite the lampstand. The king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed. You know, we miss it in the humor of the Bible. Can you see anybody's color changing? The king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. And all of a sudden, God crashes the party. God crashes the party in a dramatic, in an unusual way. And without warning, a disembodied hand is coming, and it's coming to a place that's a plaster on the wall, opposite the lampstand. It's writing something all of a sudden. It's a disembodied hand. No, no rest of the arm, no body, no torso, nothing. A disembodied hand just writing four words that we will see later in Aramaic on the wall. At first, the king in his drunken stupor may have thought, well, I think I'm seeing some stuff. But all of a sudden, the party comes to a crashing end. Everybody is seeing the same thing that the king is seeing as well. And that is four words written in their language. Words of judgment from God. And so you see that the Lord intervened immediately by his verdict on the wall. You know, this is a very simple application that I want to bring to myself and to all of us seated here. And listen to me carefully, please. Do you see spiritual activities as weighty matters in your life? Do I see spiritual activities as weighty matters in, your li- in my life? And there are many in our church. There are many activities in our church. Don't we have it? Don't we have them? We have the Sunday morning worship. We have the second message or, or the second uh, meeting that goes on. We have an outreach. We have cell groups. We have... Uh, sisters' meetings, we have everything else, and we have various other meetings as well. And the question is, are these things important to you? Are these things important to me? Let me ask you another question. What about spiritual disciplines? Those are spiritual activities as well. Are those things important to you? Is your morning Bible reading or your family prayer or particularly men leading your families in prayer or in a family Bible study or discipling your wife and your kids. Is that important to you? Is that important to me? You know, my friends, it is easy to make excuses and I can make a lot of excuses. All of us can make a lot of excuses. But no matter what excuses you and I may come up with, I think my wife knows very well what is important to me. Your wife knows very well what is important to you. Because they are the ones who watch us very closely. Your kids know what is important to you. My wife knows very well whether cricket is important to me or the word of God is important to me. Doesn't she? Of course she does. Your wife knows very well whether something else is important to you or the word of God is important to you or leading the family in the right way of the Lord is important to you. You know, I once heard of a a man who had this habit of going to the bedside of his little daughter, kneeling right beside the bedside after she has gone to sleep and praying for her. Every single day he would do that. And she was grown up and she had gone to college. And all of a sudden, she comes back one summer. She goes straight into her room, comes back out and says to the mother, Dad just prayed last night for me right next to my bed, although I was not there. Didn't he? And his mother, her mother was startled. How did you know that? 
and she said, I just saw the fresh uh, knee prints on the carpet right next to my bed. What a dad. I heard of a man who has three kids and he spends every single day, without fail, every single day, 15 minutes each with each kid, taking quiet time with them, helping them out in their quiet times. Every single day he spends 45 minutes, 15 minutes with each kid. Is that important? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I think, I want to talk to men in particular because I can relate to you as a man, as a family man. Fathers play a significant role in passing spiritual foundation to their kids. I'm not a great fan of surveys, but I think this is a very reliable survey. This is what it said. And I'm not setting aside the sovereignty of God. I'm not setting aside the godliness and the influence of a mother on the kids. But this is what the survey said. When a survey was taken, and there, there was the influence of only the mother on the kids, 15 years later, only 15% of the people turned out to be godly kids and people who would even stay in church. On the other hand, if there was the influence of the father coupled with the influence of the mother and the father leading the family, 75% of the kids, according to the survey, were not just found in church, but they were very spiritual, very active in ministry and godly kids. I don't know how they found it out, but this is a survey and I think it's a very reliable source. But at least shows to all of us seated here the importance and the influence of a spiritual leader for the family. And you and I, I plead with you, CBF, you and I ought to take this very seriously. And if you and I want CBF to be a healthy church, it begins in the family. And you and I must rise up to the occasion to lead our families in godly ways. And you and I can't take spiritual activities lightly, like Belshazzar did the gold goblets. So in verses 1 through 6, we saw, you must take spiritual things with complete seriousness. You must take spiritual things with complete seriousness. Then there's a second thing you need to be sure about, that, uh, to make sure that you're not taking the Lord for granted. And that is in verses 7 through 24. They say that you must act on the lessons the Lord has taught you. You must act on the lessons the Lord has taught you. These are very simple points from this passage. You must act on the lessons the Lord has taught you. The many truths he's teaching us, the many truths that God is teaching us in our lives and through the lives of others who we see around us cannot be taken casually. The truths that we glean from our own lives that the Lord is teaching us and from the lives of others cannot be taken casually and ought not to be taken lightly. And that's precisely what we learn from this episode. Daniel admonished King Belshazzar that he failed to learn the lessons from history. Again, we see this played out in two scenes, and I'll be quick. Firstly, Daniel was called to interpret the writing as the diviners of Babylon could not do it. And this is in verses 7 through 16, but I'll just read three verses, verses 10, 11, and 12, just to make the point. The queen, the queen here is not Belshazzar's wife, but it ought to be translated as the queen mother. So this is Belshazzar's mother, Nebuchadnezzar's wife. So the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. Even the mother has seen the color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. In the day of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, uh, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers. Because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve puzzles were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Now I told you it's been 70 years since Daniel came into Babylon. Remember when Daniel first came into Babylon, the astrologers were of no use. They couldn't interpret anything. Even after 70 years, they are doing the same thing. And I don't know what on earth for they are still in the king's enchanter's company, astrologer's company. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't still interpret anything. It only shows the futility of false gods and the wisdom of this world. It is only the God of the Bible who can 
throw light into dark places, can interpret things that he alone can give. And so the king's offer was very simple. If anybody would interpret the writing on the wall correctly, he would put a gold chain, he would put a purple robe on him, and this was a chance of a lifetime, he would make him the third highest ruler in the entire kingdom of Babylon. And so all these men tried to interpret it, trying to become the third highest ruler in the kingdom, but all of them failed, and all of a sudden, it was not getting very late in the other part of the kingdom where the queen mother was about to go to bed because she heard some shrieks and screams coming from this party area. And all of a sudden, she comes down to see what's happening in the party. She also notices the writing on the wall. She reads that. She looks at his, her son, sees the color off his, of uh, his face. And so she says, well, I know what your trouble is, but don't be troubled. There's a man. Which tells me that Daniel had not been invited to the party. Why would he be? If there's a drinking party and orgy is going on somewhere in Bangalore, would you and I be invited? It's trouble if you and I are invited. But then, there is a, but then when it comes to a moment of crisis, they will call us. Would you pray for me? My father has cancer. Would you pray for me? You know, that's exactly what is happening here. Daniel was not called to the party, but all of a sudden, when trouble came, when crisis moments came, Daniel was called. And Daniel comes here to interpret the dream or, or the writing on the wall. Second thing, Daniel reproved the king that he had rejected what God had taught him. Verses 17 through 24, but I'll just read two verses, 22 and 23. Just follow along, please. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart Though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house you have brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but God in whose hands is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored. Now here is what's happening. Daniel, the slave who was brought in from Judah, from Jerusalem, enters the scene. And I think all these 70 years, he had lived a very godly life. Everybody had seen his, his life and the kind of integrity that he had. Even the queen mother recognized that. And they also remembered that this is the same man, Daniel, who had brought Nebuchadnezzar a couple of times out of the jam. And so when a crisis moment came, he was called to interpret the writing on the wall. And I think this is the last act of service that Daniel is doing the, to the Babylonian kingdom because Babylon is going to fall the very same night. And Belshazzar now comes and offers Daniel the very same thing. Daniel is a tough nut to crack. He's not impressed with all of these earthly gifts. He says, you can keep the gifts for yourself, but I will still interpret the writing for you. And then he proceeds to give the king three lessons. One is a lesson in theology, one is a lesson in history, and the other one is how to read. He gives three lessons. The first thing, he reminds the king of what happened to the grandfather. He says, do you remember what happened to your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar? And how God humbled him. He became insane. We studied that last time I spoke. He became insane. He became like an animal eating the grass of the field. And until he repented, until he understood that heaven rules and God is the one who is sovereign over everything and he sets up men as kings for a time that he ordains, until he recognized that, he was humble. And you know that very well, Belshazzar. Knowing full well the history lessons, especially about what happened in your family to your own grandfather and how your grandfather's repentance brought about blessings to him, you've not done the same thing. But in fact, you made a mockery of the God of the Bible by bringing those goblets and drinking wine from them. And not just that, you praised the gods of gold and silver and made a mockery of the true God. Daniel is just saying, Belshazzar, you should have known better. You should have known better about what was happening. So Daniel reproved the king that he had rejected what God had taught him. And my simple question to you this morning is, what lessons has God been teaching you lately? What lessons has God been teaching you lately in your life? And I need to ask this question of myself as well. What lessons has God been teaching me of late? Why is that important? 
You know, I'll be honest with you, this question makes people very uncomfortable. When I ask this question personally of people, this makes them very uncomfortable. And often I see that people are having to make up stuff to answer this question. Why? Because they don't even recognize the hand of God in their own life and what God has been teaching them. And that's a dangerous thing. That's a dangerous thing. Has he been teaching you about humility? Has he been teaching you about marriage? Has he been teaching you about how to handle success, in fact, or success in ministry, success in a secular field? Has he been teaching you about pride? Has he been teaching you about pain and suffering in your life? I don't know what God has been speaking to you of late. Only God in his sovereignty and his omniscience would know it, and you know it if you have recognized it. But whatever it may be, whatever the topic may be or the matter may be that God has been speaking to you about, you must take it with great urgency because very soon the Lord is going to catch you on the very same topic. The Lord is going to catch you on the very same issue. And so you and I must take it seriously. He's been preparing you to learn the lessons well so you could come out victorious no matter what the situations. So the question again is, what lessons has the Lord been teach, teaching you lately? There's no time, and so I'll just pass and move to my final point. Just probably seven more minutes, and I'll be through. So two things we saw so far that we need to do to be sure that we are not taking God for granted. Number one, we saw that we must take spiritual things with complete seriousness. Then we saw that we must also act on the lessons that the Lord has taught us. Then there's a third thing and a final thing that I'd like to look at. And that is in verses 25 through 31. They say that you must be confident that God's word is sure and does not fail. You must be confident that God's word is sure and does not fail. Though the days may turn into months, months into years, years into decades and decades into centuries, you can be sure that the Lord's word will be fulfilled and will absolutely be fulfilled to the T. And Belshazzar discovered this truth in a very hard way. What happened? King Belshazzar was indifferent to God's word and came under God's sudden judgment. He was indifferent to God's word and came under God's judgment. Let's look at two vignettes very quickly that describe it and then we'll move to the application and then we'll, we'll be done. Firstly, Daniel explained the writing but King Belshazzar did not repent. Daniel explained the writing, but King Belshazzar did not repent. Verses 25 through 29, I'll just read verses 25 through 28. This is an important part of the passage, so please look at it attentively. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, meaning God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, meaning you have weighed in, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to Medes and Persians. And Parson means divided. And so Daniel goes on to interpret the interpretation with a very short and terse one. And it is to the point. He says, many means numbered. Your days have been numbered. King, your days have been numbered. In fact, if you remember the statue that God showed King Nebuchadnezzar, there was a statue of gold. And below that was... Please go back and look at Daniel chapter 2. All right? So there was an inferior kingdom that was coming after Nebuchadnezzar the Great. But his days were numbered. And those days were coming to an end in the life of Belshazzar. And so God is saying that your days have been numbered. Tekel, you have been weighed and found wanting. God weighs each one of us. God weighs the hearts of each one of us. And we ought to be careful about how we are found in the balances. And so God says, you've been weighed, you've been found wanting. King Belshazzar, you did not measure up to God's standards. And then finally he says, Tekel Parson, which means your kingdom has been divided. And outside the city gates right here, there are, there's a collusion of kings that's happening. There's Medo kingdom and there's a Persian kingdom. Both of them are going to come and attack you. 
That's exactly what was the interpretation. But the king, instead of falling on his face like Nebuchadnezzar did and repenting, you know what he does? He begins to honor Daniel just to make sure that he is giving or he is true to his promises. So he says, bring the purple robe, bring the gold chain, and Daniel is made the third highest ruler in the entire kingdom of Babylon. Secondly, King Belshazzar was slain by Darius the Mede on the same night. Verses 30 and 31. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, uh, being about 62 years old. The end of the story comes very quickly. Outside lurking were the Medes and the Persians together. And so Darius the Mede, who was about 62 years old, comes at very night. As soon as the prophecy was delivered, I think the party started again. And in the middle of the night, this kingdom comes and completely destroys Babylon. Babylon comes to an end. Belshazzar's life comes to an end. And the entire Babylonian empire, which is one of the greatest empires the world has ever known, comes to an inglorious end. And so there are four things that I want to look at. I'll just mention that to you. And listen to me very carefully, please. We ought to take lessons from this inglorious end for our own lives. Number one, Babylon became great because of the sovereign blessing of God. Babylon became great because of the sovereign blessing of God. Number two, when they became great, their pride made them forget God. Number three, when they forgot God, they began to take him for granted. Number four, when they took him for granted, God judged them and they were no longer a great nation. When they took him for granted, God judged them and they were no longer a great nation. And my application this morning for you and for me is, do you take God's word with utmost care? Do you take God's word with utmost care? Is the word of God important to you? Let me, let me just uh, share a very personal story. Um, so, uh, and, and please get the point uh, correct, take it in the right spirit. And this is not to talk anything about anything else. But uh, uh, as a church family, just understand this right way, please. Um, we have this Truth and Life Academy. And uh, in that, every month we have a program called Enrich India where evangelists from all over Karnataka, not just evangelists, some elders and deacons come and train with us. There are about 25 of us coming every month. And, and this Wednesday and Thursday, we have the sessions happening as well. I want to talk about two of them. I, I spend personal time with each one of them, and I want to talk about two of them. One guy that I shall leave unnamed because he is from this very city, goes to a Kannada Brethren Assembly. He is a deacon in a Kannada Brethren Assembly. He's an auto driver. Comes on, a, it happens on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So comes on a Wednesday morning in his auto attire, puts the auto in the parking lot, changes his clothes, comes and sits in the class for all those two days and goes back the second day evening. For those two days, he doesn't drive his auto. I don't know how he's making his bread and butter. So I got concerned about this and I looked at him and I asked the question, are you not, are you not losing money? I mean, this is your bread and butter, isn't it? for these two days. And he said, Sir, within the proximity of where I live, this is the only avenue where I can study the word of God. And if I don't take this seriously, God is going to hold me accountable. I don't care about two days of auto rides and losing money, but God is going to hold me accountable. This is what he said, and I was surprised. God is going to hold me accountable if I don't attend this. Another man, I will mention his name. His name is Rangaswamy. Rabbi Chan might remember him. He comes from Kamam in Telangana. Well, he was supposed to be in Andhra, but Prithvi stole the state away from us. And so uh, he is now in, he's now in Telangana. So he comes from Kamam. He is the elder of a church. When I shook hands with him, it was so hard. And I asked him, what do you do for a living, sir? He said, I am a daily wage worker. I carry cement and all of that, but I'm the elder of a church, and he comes here every month. And uh, I asked him the same question, aren't you losing your daily wage for those two days? He said, sir, within where I live, I don't get any training, and if I don't get any training, I don't get my theology right, I can't preach the word, my assembly will not grow. And so I'm going to lose those two days of daily wage. 
and somehow make it up on the other days to feed my family. But I'm going to come every month and make that sacrifice because it's important to me. Now, this is not about Truth and Life Academy. Please don't get it that way. This is about the interest and the sacrifice of the people that they're making to study the Word of God. My dear friends, brothers and sisters, we are well-educated. We have everything right on this. In fact, you can download a couple of seminaries onto this. What sacrifices are you making to study the Word? Sacrifice of time? What sacrifices are you making to attend a Bible study if you can't study it yourself? There could be thousand, again, I could give thousand excuses for not going there. But at the end of the day, what is important is that God is looking at your heart and it just goes to show to the Lord that the word of God is not important to you. May I ask you a very personal question, please? When was the last time you opened the Bible and studied a passage by yourself? Not just read the passage, studied a passage by yourself. Some of us can't even remember that, can we? I urge you, dear brothers and sisters in CBF, when we call this the sword of the spirit, let's mean it by studying it and by giving it utmost importance and by taking it with utmost care. You know, you may be sitting here and thinking, Ravant, you've been talking about three things and I've failed in all the three of them. Or I've failed in a couple of them. Is there hope? Oh, absolutely. There is hope in Christ Jesus. There is nothing for which, if you really repent, God will not forgive us off. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But the important thing is that you recognize in not doing all these three things, you've been taking God for granted. I've been taking God for granted. And so this morning, it is important for us, not when we go home, but sitting right here to repent of our attitude and come back to serving God with our whole heart. And God will forgive us and give us a second chance. So what's the point of this morning's sermon? The whole chapter basically says, you do not take God for granted when you are serious about your spiritual things, when you act on what the Lord has taught you and take God's word with utmost care. You do not take God for granted when you are serious about your spiritual things, act on what the Lord has taught you and take God's word with great care. When you're always connected to God through the basic disciplines that he has given us, it is very difficult for us to take God for granted. And so let's be in that stream. Just a couple of illustrations and I'll be through. I think these are just quotations and I'll be through. Nobel laureate uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he's from Russia. You may have heard of him. When he received the Temple 10 Prize for Religion in the year 1983, he gave a fantastic ad address and I urge you to go and Google it up and read the address. He's a Christian, he's a believer. Fantastic address given at Templeton Lectures. If you don't find it, just, uh, just send me a message. I will send you a copy of it. And he was talking about why Russia had crumbled, why the morals had crumbled, and that had resulted in killing of 60 million people. What happened to the morals in Russia? Why did atheism take hold? Why did the communism uh, the communist government take hold. And he was talking about that and he's saying, the first reason that I see is because people of Russia have been alienated from God. And that's why the morals came down. And then he went on to say this. When I was a little boy growing up, I used to play around and my grandfather and all of them would sit and discuss what is the reason for the decadence of Russia? What is this reason for the plight that has come upon us? And invariably, my grandfather would respond by saying, it is because we, the Russians, have forgotten God. And then this man says in that lecture, after all these years, and he's a great scholar, he had just finished writing a 5,008 volume book on the Russian history. And then he says, after reading thousands and thousands of pages, after writing thousands and thousands of pages, after interviewing several people in Russia, I've come to the same conclusion in my research that my grandfather had come to years ago when I was a child. The reason why we are in this misery is because we have forgotten God. 
We have forgotten God. A.W. Tozer once said this. I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing for God. The lack of it has brought us to a present low estate. When there's no longing for God, it brings us to a low estate. The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency or taking God for granted is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. Too bad with many of us. He waits so long, so long, but in vain. May that not be true of your life and mine. When God waits for us, let us not take him for granted, but repent and come back to him, to his fold, to live the kind of life that he wants us to live. I just pray that God has spoken to you this morning, and I pray that you would take all of this seriously as from himself.